For over 34 years, I have been advising seven, eight, and nine-figure millionaires. Early in my career, I began to see two camps of millionaires, those with amazing lives and those who struggled, sometimes with their money, often with their health, and often with their relationships. And I became fascinated and intrigued to determine what was the secret of success. Why were some people so amazingly successful and others struggled? I continued my research, and it became clear that many people are only using part of their brain. So I wanted to figure out, okay, what is the connection between success and how much of our brain we used? And on my journey, I discovered what really is at the core of both, and it is your worth barometer. It changed my life. It has changed thousands of others' lives, my clients, my community, and it can yours too. So let's dive in. Hi, my name is Annette Bao, your host of the Wealth Inside and Out podcast. I'm a certified financial planner and founder of the Millionaire Insider. For over 30 years, I have been advising and researching the top 1% of millionaires, and I am passionately obsessed with money, mindset, and the intersection of self-worth and net worth, and how the two connect and allow us to live fulfilled and wealthy lives on our terms. I'm a Midwestern girl who had a dream, began investing $25 a month 35 years ago, and today have a multi-million dollar net worth. I teach the tried and true that only someone with over three decades of experience advising millionaires would know. This podcast is different about much more than money. We talk about mindset, success, money blocks, worth barometer, and all aspects of money and topics from practical manifestation, along with real world how-to and everything in between with the goal of making your journey easier and more fun. Think of this as coffee, actually matcha tea, learning real world common sense money and life advice from a BFF that you can start applying today. If you want to create a financially free life you love, you are in the right place, my friend. This is the Wealth Inside and Out podcast. So let's dive into how to elevate your worth barometer to achieve wealth, health, and happiness. Do you ever feel stuck? Like you're not making enough progress on what you want to achieve, or maybe you want more money or more success or better relationships or even to lose weight, but you're not sure how. My entire life has been in search of the secret of success. And what I found is that the worth barometer at the core level literally dictates the success or lack thereof you get in every aspect of your life. The information we provide is not intended to replace any investment, financial, tax, or any other advice. Before beginning, please consult with your own team of advisors and review your situation. You agree to hold MillionaireSeries.com, Annette Ba'u, and all affiliates harmless for information contained in these trainings. All international copyrights are reserved. If you want to follow along, you can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash WBG and download the Worth Barometer Guide. If you're like me, you love following along and starting to create your own plan, and this guide is going to help you do that. So again, themillionaireinsider.com forward slash WBG. For today's show notes and resources, go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash three. For all shows, go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash podcast. So let's start with the history of the worth barometer. So early in my career, as I mentioned, I saw all these people. I just basically saw two different camps of people. Some were really successful and others struggled. And the interesting thing is that they all had money. But the difference was the quality of their life, how much of a fulfilled life they had. And I became so fascinated to figure out what was the key. And it took me years to figure it out. And it also took me years to figure out that a lot of times people with money have a very low worth barometer. Money is no indication of your worth barometer. Some people that have money have a healthy one, some don't. And what I started realizing is that by even making minor tweaks in your worth barometer, it can dramatically improve your results. So what is the worth barometer? It's a term I coined in my second book, The Seven Principles of Becoming a Fulfilled and Wealthy Millionaire. You can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash 7p hyphen 15 VIP if you want to learn more. But 
What it basically is, is a person's belief system and their self-esteem and self-worth. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, your self-worth is a belief, and that's true. But I want you to think of it in two different senses. Like the beliefs you have, the beliefs you have about money, the beliefs you have about millionaires, the beliefs you have about success. And then I also want you to think about the belief you have about yourself, your internal clock. Are you enough? Are you constantly writing yourself or do you support yourself? How do you show up? And what I have found in literally over 40 years of research is that it is the biggest determinant of success and really of living a fulfilled and wealthy life. So why is the worth barometer so critical? As I mentioned, it is the number one indicator of your results. It dictates everything about your life, not just wealth, but peace of mind, happiness, joy, and health. And what I found is that people who have a healthy worth barometer still had challenges, but it was how they dealt with them. And it was the fact that they were a little bit slower in their processes because they were working more from their prefrontal cortex as compared to from their limbic brain. And what's interesting is while you can have money, people with a low worth barometer would be on a roller coaster ride. They'd have money, then they go bankrupt. Have money, go bankrupt. You can't be wealthy, healthy, and fulfilled if you live below the grid. So let's look at the grid. Now, the one thing you've got to understand about the grid is it can trigger people. In fact, one of the things I've seen is that because it starts talking about what's happening in your life and your own responsibility, your own ownership, for sometimes it triggers us. And I know that if I would have heard about this In the first probably 35 years of my life, I would have been triggered too. So I get it. Because I spent up to probably in my mid-30s, later 30s, about 20% above the grid and 80% below the grid. And now I'm so happy to say I spend about 80% above the grid and 20% below the grid. But the more you can spend moments and time in your life above the grid, happiness, peace, joy, love calmness. That is ideal as compared to below the grid. Fear, anger, worry, anxiety, sadness, all of those things. So the goal is above the grid, but at the same time, we're never going to always be above the grid. That would be abnormal. So you got to understand there's going to be above the grid and below the grid, and that is completely normal. But what I want you to understand is sometimes it does trigger people. I want you to liken it to a radio station. So most people understand that if you are dialed into 98.7, which is hard rock, and you want to listen to soft jazz on 99.9, I mean, it doesn't matter what you do. You can own it all you want. You can wish it. You can be mad about it. Nothing's going to change, right? You got a problem. You can complain until you're blue in the face, but what you got to do is change the radio station. Same thing with our beliefs. If we're tuned into wealthy or successful people are bad or I'm not enough, mm, we got to redial. We got to rewire that. Or we might be dialed into I'm enough. Wealthy people are good, honest people. The bottom line, my friends, is we're all dialed into different radio stations, different channels. And if you want different results, you just got to change the radio station. And that's the best news of all. So you don't like your results? Let's move the dial. So the one thing that I found, now you have to understand this has evolved because I was so fascinated with it and it just bothered me that I could not figure this out. And in episode five, I dive deeper into how I even came about my fascination with the brain and all that. So I'm not going to dive into that in this episode. You can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash five and learn about that. But what I have found is that 99% of people with amazing results focus a large part of their time on elevating their worth barometer. And one of the things that happened to me right after I graduated with my BS in finance from Arizona State, I went to a job fair and I was hired by one of the largest financial firms in the U.S. with the agreement that after six months of going through a new org training, I could be my own agent. I had no guarantee base, but unlimited upside. And I was ecstatic. And what ended up happening is after that six months, the manager said, you know, now we need to talk. And you know that feeling you get in your stomach where you're like, this is not good. He's like, you're young, you're attractive, and you're female. You don't have what it takes. You'll never make it. So before we go any further, I just want you to know that the only person that gets to decide if you make it is you, period. There's no negotiation on that. Not your manager, not your spouse, not anyone, you. 
and you don't have what it takes. Well, clearly I didn't. That's why you have mentors. That's why you're listening to me. And I wish I would have had the fortitude. I wish I would have had the wisdom to say, well, why do you think I'm here? If everyone had it figured out, we wouldn't need mentors. I just think that to this day is the most bizarre thing for somebody to say to someone, especially at that vulnerable of a state in my life. But make a long story short, he said, you are driven and you're smart, so you can work with Tim. Well, Tim had an even lower opinion of women. Make a long story short, I quit. But of course, Tim had to let me know what a loser I was going to be and that I'd never make it. And oh my God, it was just still to this day beyond my comprehension. You know, he basically shared with me that the only women making it in the financial services industry were sleeping with their clients. And, you know, it's just like, you have to understand that was a long time ago, and I'm not saying it was acceptable. But the thing that was so frustrating when I look back on that was that I actually believed him. I'm like, oh, that's why there are so few women in the financial services industry. I mean, I was that naive, and it's just embarrassing to even admit. However, what's even worse than that is that, so I quit, and of course he told me, you know, I'm going to be a loser, I'll never make it, all these like really, really hurtful, mean things. And I don't even remember getting from my office home because I was so hysterically crying, and I'm not like a real crier. And I called my mom, who was always my biggest cheerleader, and she's like, you know, you just need to find a different option, and you need to focus on what you can and move forward and all that. Well, I did find another job, but not without literally, I was so below the grid because at the time I didn't even know there was a grid. I didn't even really know there was a worth barometer. And I was angry for probably five years. And all I can say, it must have been the grace of God, whatever your beliefs are, the grace of spirit. But I just got this message that I was spending so much time, like I was thinking about what I was going to do when I was successful and what I was going to say to them, and how it's going to show up. And at the time, my only goal was I want to make $100,000 a year, and I want to have a net worth of $1 million. I mean, I think back on that, and I think, oh, it is just so funny where I, where I am now. I mean, it's just fascinating. But it just goes to show that I think when you're head and heart are in the right place, and you're really focusing on the right thing, amazing things happen. But anyway, I was so angry. And then I woke up one day, and I thought, oh, I'm spending so much energy on these people that I don't even want in my life. If I just start focusing in on helping my clients and being the best I can be, I may never become a millionaire. I may never become a top producer, but I'm going to at least make a difference and things are going to be better than they would be with me staying in this negative energy, right? And so I just went on about my career and I started doing what I could do, making connections and working very, very hard. In fact, I was probably working too hard because I didn't really get a lot of the things that I'm teaching you. Well, fast forward about four years after that, my first major deal where I earned just under a million dollars in my pocketbook, meaning take home cash, that manager who said, you don't have what it takes, you'll never make it, had been trying to work with this client for over a decade. I'm convinced that had I not elevated my worth barometer and really started focusing in above the grid, I don't think that would have ever happened. So hopefully that's going to help you as we dive into the grid. As I mentioned, for some people it triggers. I don't want it to trigger you. I want it to motivate you to change. As I mentioned, I lived so far below the grid for so many years of my life, it's embarrassing to even admit. So one of the most common questions I would get when I'd speak at, and I spoke a lot in my career, was how do you determine where you're at in the worth barometer? Like if you have a healthy one or an unhealthy one, and that's how I came up with the grid, was to let people know like what are characteristics of people who live above the grid And what are characteristics of people who live below the grid? And one of my favorite quotes is to always let your character and your values and who you are be stronger than what's happening out there, stronger than your circumstances. So the grid, we measure it on three levels. Above the grid is a level three. It's a can-do, will-do attitude. You're optimistic and positive. Your energy is of a higher vibration. It's kind of like it's high energy, but it's a calm high energy. You take personal responsibility of ownership of what's happening in your life, regardless of whose fault it might be, because you understand that there's an opportunity in every situation. Your focus is on the vision of your future, and the primary emotion is love. 
love, followed by peace, joy, all of those things. And then at the grid is a level two. And conceptually, people that are at a level two understand it, but they rationalize and justify and their emotions vacillate. They're above the grid and they're below the grid. It's There's not a lot of consistency and they are probably more of like a 50-50. And then below the grid is a level one. This is a can't do, won't do attitude. Energy is low and negative. Their outlook is typically pessimistic. They lack personal responsibility and ownership. They're a bully or a victim. Their focus is on pain and their primary emotion is fear also anger, worry, all of those negative emotions. Now, as I mentioned, we're never always above the grid or below the grid. I grew up and I was about 20% above the grid, 80% below. Now I'm about 80% above, 20% below. And I think part of it, what happens as you get older, because, you know, there's a lot of thoughts that, you know, it's about a 50-50 and at the grid it is. But as you become more conscious, as you start practicing techniques and strategies to quiet down your limbic brain. Because see, your limbic brain is what's dictating how you see a situation and how you show up. Do you show up above the grid or below the grid? And the more you can get in the driver's seat of your life where your prefrontal cortex is running the show as compared to your limbic brain, the more time you'll spend above the grid. But the primary emotions, love, peace, calmness, joy, inspiration, motivation, optimism, How they show up, understanding non-judgmental, a win-win. They're focused on a win-win. They're accepting. They're clear. They can be very empathetic. They take responsibility. They do the work that others won't do, and they have a can-do, will-do attitude. And they live in a drama-free zone. And ironically enough, and not surprising, they attract ideal clients. The focus is on the solution, and the energy is high and positive. Now, this is really critical. People above the grid have very similar situations as people below the grid. But people that reside more of the time above the grid, their focus is on the solution. People who reside below the grid, their focus is on the problem. And then at the grid, as I mentioned, they understand the levels, but they're not as conscious or present, and they oftentimes rationalize or justify what they do. And so you just got to be aware of it because the problem being at the grid I almost think that's more dangerous than being below the grid because most people that live the majority of the time below the grid don't even know there is a grid. So just be aware of that. And one of the things I will say too about being at the grid is, you know, they go through the motions, they'll do the work, but they don't ever really have clarity. And because they don't take ownership in a lot of things, They always end up somewhere. The problem is that destination somewhere is rarely where you want to be. And then they wonder, why me? What happened? You know, life's unfair, when in reality, it was how they showed up that that caused the problem. All right, below the grid, fear, worry, anger, anxiety, jealousy, depression, agitation, all of those things. They show up as a victim, like a lose-win, I lose, you win, or as a bully. They win, you lose. They're very judgmental. They have an extreme need to be right. They blame, lack of responsibility. They don't take ownership. They lack focus. They live in the drama zone. They're easily distracted. They make excuses. They don't do the work and then they blame others. They have a need to control others or act superior to others. They attract challenges, problem clients. They're always looking for that silver bullet. Very difficult time for people below the grid to stay focused. And they've, it's just always on the next thing, shiny object. It wreaks havoc on their lives, on their investment plan, their money, everything. And as I mentioned, there will be somebody above the grid and below the grid, they'll have the same issue. Like, God forbid they get cancer. God forbid they have a downturn in the economy. The person above the grid is focused on the solution. The person below the grid is focused on the problem. As you can imagine... The results are mind-blowing because when you're focused in on the solution, you show up very differently than when you're focused in on the problem. One of the reasons why the grid is so critical is you attract others who are where you are vibrationally or energetically. Think about how you feel when you're around somebody who's really motivational or inspiring and then how you feel when you're around somebody who is miserable or complains all the time. Every level of the grid has a story, a story of success or a failure. Above the grid pulls you, below the grid pushes you. 
As Michael Beckwith said, you can't have what you want until vibrationally you're ready for it. If you do get it before you're ready for it, you're going to lose it. Pain will push you until your vision pulls you. This is about us, my friends, not anyone out there, not our peers, not our boss, not our business, not our spouse, us. Now, one of the things I want to share, and this is something that's so interesting, that I've recently been learning. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of different research in different areas. I'm getting certified in some different areas and really studying under some people who have done similar works to this. And there are different philosophies that, you know, we kind of live like a 50-50. You know, half the time we've got positive emotions, half the time we've got negative ones. And I do agree that that's kind of where we probably start. But as I mentioned, my first 30 to 40 years of my life, I was so below the grid, it's embarrassing. You know, gossip, fear, everything was just not a positive, fulfilled life. But once I started to understand the worth barometer, and more importantly, the impact it has on our lives, everything around me shifted. And the ultimate goal is to spend more time above the grid. It would be abnormal to spend all your time above the grid, but I want you to just focus on the goal is to spend more time above the grid. I always would say as quickly as you can get above the grid, but I have reevaluated that. And one of the things that I think is really important is that when something doesn't go your way, let's say you get in an argument with your partner or your spouse or something happens with a client and right away you feel whether it's fear, anxiety, worry, sadness. What I want you to do instead of figuring out your triggers, and we're going to talk about those in a minute and your backtracks, I want you to just sit in it. So it's kind of like you get in an argument with someone, and I say spouse because I think that's most common. You know, something happens and you get in an argument with your spouse and you're feeling, you might feel like you're perspiring a little bit, your heart's racing a little faster, you're frustrated, you know, you might rehash in your mind what they said, what you said. And all I want you to do is just sit there. Now, there's a couple things you can do. What I like to do is always just kind of look from afar and go, oh, it's really interesting that that triggered me. I wonder what that's all about. Now, Where I get triggered probably even more so than my spouse is my kids. Like if something happens with my kids, I can get really triggered. And so I've had to really learn how to be like, okay, they've got to fight their battles. I can't always be there fighting their battles. But just being aware of it. The other thing, too, that can be really good is to just sit there and notice how you're feeling. And the reason that that is so powerful is because you're training your limbic brain that when things don't go how you want them to, you're going to be okay. See, a lot of us kind of have this belief that if things don't go our way or we're sad or we're angry or we're worried or whatever it may be, that, I don't know, the world's going to come to end. Our limbic brain kicks in and we think a tiger's going to eat us and we're going to die and all these things happen because that's how our primal or limbic brain shows up. And so what I want you to do is to just feel it and learn how you can survive it and that you're okay. We've got to train our primal brain that we're going to be okay when something happens that we don't want to happen. And then what happens is we can transfer that feeling, that knowledge, that knowing into other areas of our lives. Like in our business, when we're making warm calls or we're talking to cold prospects, the key is to train your limbic brain so you can handle other tough situations because you've got the experience and the proof you're not going to be eaten by a tiger or you're not risking your life. It's amazing. I want you to get comfortable when you feel uncomfortable. Get comfortable when you feel dis-ease. You're not in ease of life. So powerful. Now, if you want a deeper dive into learning more about the concepts behind the worth barometer, I encourage you to access my book, The Seven Principles of Becoming a Fulfilled and Wealthy Millionaire. You can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash 7P hyphen 15 VIP. All right, how can you elevate your worth barometer? All right, the first thing is to get adequate sleep, seven to eight and a half hours each night. You got to remember that you're awake about 30 to 90 minutes each night. So if you go to bed at 10 and get up at six, That's eight hours, but then you take 30 minutes, that's seven and a half, you take 90, and you've only gotten six and a half. So you got to factor that in, but sleep is critical. The second thing you got to do is slow down and quiet your mind. You want to be able to recharge and use that muscle in your brain, not only to slow down, 
but also to stay focused on what you want. Focus breathing is a powerful tool. And what you can do is put your feet flat on the ground. If you need support, put your palms facing down on your knees. If you feel really motivated and you want to let more energy in, face them up to the heavens. But you breathe in through your nose to the count of eight. Hold it for eight. Release for 16. And just do a few of those. You'll feel so calm. Now, you can also do silent meditation, but that's more difficult. And I've been doing it for 30 years. I still find it difficult. But primary strategies, focus breathing or silent meditation, in my opinion, in my research, is critical. You can then add in secondary strategies, which is more like yoga, guided meditation, prayer, positive prayer, walks, hikes, all of those things. Eat a clean diet. Ideally, you're eating non-starchy organic veggies, healthy fat, lean protein, and then you're drinking plenty of water. I recommend that you drink 50% of your body weight in ounces of water each day. Now, if you work out, more. So if you weigh 130 pounds, you're going to drink 65 ounces. And what I do is I recommend right when you get up in the morning, you drink the first 16 ounces and then... I drink before I eat. Now, I have a protocol where I eat in the morning and then I eat at dinner and I don't fast. I fast the other times. And I find that that has really worked well for my blood sugar and my overall mental clarity, health, everything. But then I drink another 16 ounces at 10 right before I'm going to eat. I eat about 1030. So if you're going to drink water before you eat, 30 minutes before or an hour after is what is recommended. And then I drink another 16 ounces mid-afternoon, and then I drink another 16 ounces right before I eat, about 30 minutes before I eat. So again, you got to see what works for you, but ideally you're not drinking during meals because you want to be optimizing your enzymes. And there's a lot of research that's been done that if you drink during meals, you actually dilute them, which makes it much more difficult for you to digest them. So just be aware of that. You want to exercise your mind and your body. Meditation, yoga are powerful, as are cardio, stretching, and weight training. Now, I could do yoga and cardio and meditation all day long, but my weak area is weight training. And so what I do is I go to a class four times a week. And what's great is I do kundalini yoga and restorative yoga every morning, But three times a week, right after I go to my weight training, we go to a restorative yin yoga class. And it's just optimal. It's just been so good. And I it's amazing how much stronger I am. I've only been doing it for about six months, but I'm like, yes. In fact, my yoga teacher goes, she she was looking at she goes, You look like a 20-year-old. I'm like, that's so funny. I'm in better shape than I was when I was in my 20s. But I was like, that is so nice of you to say. She goes, I can really tell in your body. I'm like, yes. The next thing we want to do is identify and improve triggers, responses, and backtracks. We want to know when we go below the grid. Now, we've got to train our primal limbic brain that when we go below the grid, we're going to be okay. So I used to always say, as quickly as we can, we want to get above the grid. I don't agree with that. Because one of the things that I have found in doing this, and I always, before I poo-poo anything, I will try it. And I encourage you to do the same. If it works, great. If it doesn't, all right, figure out what does work for you. You know, it's not a right or wrong. you got to figure out what works for you because you're the one that's going to be doing it. But this is what I found. So I would always fast for about 14 to 16 hours. I've done that for quite a while. And so now I finish eating typically around 6. And so then I'd fast until the next day at about 10 or 7, and then I'd fast until 11. And then i eat, and then what would happen is about midday I'd start getting hungry, Right. And so, of course, I'm like, oh, I've got to eat. And my mentor, my new one of my new mentors, she's like, why? She's like, why don't you just not eat during that, you know, let's see, it's like 11 to 5. So what is that, 6 or 7 hours? It's actually 5, 6 hours. So why don't you just not eat during those 6 hours? And I'm like, oh, that never dawned on me. And then she's like, you know, it's because we have this belief, like we get a little bit hungry and oh my gosh. And it's so weird because what I have found is you have to train your limbic brain. Like the first few days, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. And then it was kind of like I drank some water and I was like, forgot about it. But there was something in me that thought like, 
oh, if I don't eat, I could get really hungry. <laughs> like, like, what's going to happen? Am I going to die? I don't think so. I've got plenty of fat. And so I laughed because I was like, it was just training my mind. And so sitting in that unknown, that fear, that anxiety, that worry is so powerful because you're kind of like, oh, I can do this. And then even like at night when sometimes, you know, I've worked out and it's later and it's kind of like, you know, you get that little hunger pang. I find that if I go to bed, not super hungry, but just a little bit hungry. So I stop eating at around six-ish and then I go to bed. Ideally, the goal is to go to bed like 9.30 or 10, sometimes a little bit later. But if I go to bed and I'm just a little bit hungry, that's ideal because then I wake up hungry. When I go to bed and I'm not hungry, I don't get nearly as good a night's sleep. And part of it is you have to get used to it because when you're not used to it, you could wake up in the middle of the night hungry. But what I want you to get focused in on is just getting comfortable with it and training your brain that you're going to be okay. And then you still want to know what triggers you. Like I know if you mess with my kids, it triggers me. And I have had to work so hard because my kids are really good at sports. And I've had so many situations where people have been like on other teams, like so, you know, they always pick on the kids that are good. They always, you know, oftentimes, you know, especially in baseball, it was just so like, oh my gosh, like juvenile. And it wasn't the kids, it was the adults. And I just have had to get over that. I've had to say, you know, this is ridiculous. This is so funny that this triggers me. And I can actually look at myself, you know, like I can feel myself sweating and being like, oh my gosh, don't mess with my kids. But just different things that come up that trigger us. And it's kind of like for me, I've always been like, okay, they've got to learn how to deal with life, you know, calming down, relaxing, and then allowing myself to just get above the grid and to get into that state where I feel at my best as compared to when I feel like I'm in a state of anxiety, worry, fear, all those things below the grid. We then got to reduce stress, and a large part of reducing stress is training that primal, as I like to refer to as a limbic brain, but it's really your primal brain, your two-million-year-old brain, the one that's there to protect you. And so many of the strategies, focus breathing, silent meditation, even guided meditation, hiking, all of those things can really help to reduce stress. Now, you got to figure out what works for you. You know, I love hiking. I love yoga. I love meditation. And I will say yoga. Sometimes I don't love it. Like sometimes it's really hard, but I know the end game. I know the result. And that's what I love. And I love how I show up. You know, I used to be really, really inflexible in my beliefs. Like I was very much, this is right, that's wrong. And I grew up in a very, really a nearly negative religious experience growing up. And it was always like, we're right, what we believe, and you're wrong. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? That's why when I say prayer can be really powerful, but it's got to be positive prayer. So what I found is that in addition to us living above or below the grid, there are also entities that reside above and below the grid. You can see schools that live above or below the grid. You can see churches. That's why I always say positive prayer, because if you're in a church that's all fearful and negative below the grid, and I mean, we could get in a whole debate on this. I studied it in college because I was so fascinated with the fact that how that all came about, like why some churches are so fearful. And if you really look into it, it's because that's how they controlled the masses. See, the masses were starting to take over. And it was just fascinating to look at the history of different religions, how they went. And so again, you got to figure out what works for you. But whatever you're doing, whether it's faith, which you know, I I don't know how people survive without faith, but again, I'm not here to judge. You've got to figure out what works for you. I just know that when you are praying and it's positive prayer, it's so much more effective than negative prayer because what we focus on is going to expand. And this is something I had no idea of growing up because I, I had negative influences. My father, God bless his soul, was very negative. I had a lot of negative influence from my religion. And so what I always did was just focus in on what I didn't want, and that's all I got in my life. And I mean, I'm just lucky to be here because I truly considered in my, both in my high school years as well as my college years of committing suicide. I hated my life. I hated everything about it. And I am so thankful that I started learning how the brain works, and I was able to start focusing in on what I wanted versus what I didn't want. And so if your life's working for you with what you're doing, great. Just keep doing it. But just be aware of that because we've got to make sure that we are getting in the driver's seat of our life and we're focusing in on what we want because that's what's going to expand in your life. 
And then you got to increase reserves. Now, if reserves are just more than enough. So let's just say you need $10,000 in an emergency fund. Get $11,000. let us just say you want to weigh 130 pounds. Focus on 129. I don't care what the number is, but you want to have a little extra. Let's just say that your relationship with your spouse is really important to you and you want a happy, healthy marriage as well as family. Spend 10% more time with them. Whatever it is, just take that amount and add some to it. You want to have excess reserves. You don't want to be depleted. And then last but most certainly not least, figure out what brings you joy and then make it a priority. The goal, my friends, is a fulfilled and wealthy life. And the more you can focus on that, the better. Congratulations on taking another step to create a financially free life you love. If you're not sure about your financial future or that it's in order, or you are ready to stop worrying about money or possibly the fear of becoming a bag lady, ending up broke in retirement, or you simply are ready to know your financial house is in order so that you can have a bright financial future, please go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. And that doesn't stand for non-sufficient funds. It stands for next step finance. It's the next best step of what you need to do so you can avoid an NSF notice in your future. Again, themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. The number of women who were not broke or poor while working or married is staggering. The entire mission of the Wealth Inside and Out podcast is to ensure you have the information for you, your family, your friends, anyone who's willing to listen to it and apply it so that you can create a financially free life you love. Again, themillionaireinsider.com forward slash NSF. So again, you can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash WBG to download the Worth Barometer Guide. I encourage you to do that so you can start applying it. For today's show notes, you can go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash three. For all episodes, go to themillionaireinsider.com forward slash podcast. If you love the content of this podcast, please follow and subscribe to our channel so you get notified of episodes and also give us a five-star review and share a comment. We really appreciate it. Wasn't that easy? I mean, the worth problem is so important, but let's face it, it's pretty easy. But I want to recap on the eight tips I gave you on how to elevate your worth barometer. So one, get adequate sleep, seven to eight and a half hours each night. Slow down, quiet your mind and recharge it. Eat a clean, healthy diet. Exercise both your mind and your body. Identify and improve triggers, responses and backtracks, but also get comfortable spending time below the grid. You're going to live. No tiger is going to eat us. Find different strategies you can do to reduce stress, whether it is focused breathing, silent meditation, hikes, different types of exercise, but we've got to reduce stress. Increase reserves. Instead of having just enough, you want to have a little more than you need or a lot more. Like I love having excess reserves of money. I love having excess reserves of time, all those things. And then last but not least, determine what brings you fulfillment and joy and then make it a priority. Carve out time each day to really focus on that. Until our next episode, take one action that will help you create a financially free life you love. I'm Annette Ba'u, your host. All international copyrights are reserved. Bye for now.